Well, this week on Takedown, we'll break down the new rules of college wrestling. Kyle Dake has decided to make a test run at 86 kilos, and Dylan Wanigel stopped by to talk a little grapple at the Garden. So stay tuned. Your wrestling news starts now. Hello again, everybody. I'm Scott Casper. What do you say? It's time to take a look at what's trending this week right here on Takedown. Well, several months back, the NCAA Rules Committee recommended that two experimental stalling penalties from last year become permanent this year. Well, the group met April 15th in Indianapolis and endorsed the drop-down rule and a one-point penalty for stalling from neutral. Well, the rule involving the standing neutral position has previously been used only once, and that that was at the NWCA All-Star Classic last November. After evaluating the rules effect on that event, the committee determined that when wrestling is stopped in the neutral standing position for going out of bounds, the referee should make one of three calls. They are stalling on one or both wrestlers for leaving the wrestling area, stalling for pushing or pulling an opponent out of bounds, or stalling on neither when the action takes both athletes off the mat. Now, this is where it gets confusing. On Saturday, we talked with Iowa Hawkeye head coach Tom Brands and the Illini headman Jim Heffernan about the solution to stalling. Let me, let me just say one thing here. The number one thing is, is that I think the intentions of everybody involved are pure. All right, so that's the first thing. So we're trying to make a better product. The thing that where we're in error is, is that we're trying to do it by adding more regulations, more rules, more micromanagement. And that is an error. And I say that very authoritatively, uh, like I know what I'm talking about, which I don't. But I also but I also say it authoritatively because I've had a lot of experience in the sport and I've seen where we've been in, in a lot of trouble with the Olympics and how we did that. And I've seen where this sport has really, really thrived. And right now, in my mind, in my opinion, uh, we are heading down a path that we are going to be in trouble again. And we're going to have to learn the hard way, and then we're going to come back around, and then we'll get it fixed again. And and my my only gripe is, is that I don't think that we're going about this the right way. All right, now I'm going to get on the soapbox here. And this is my opinion. When you have a rules committee that has no or very little input from officials, right there we've got off on the wrong foot. And, you know, I don't even know if there's an official's uh, voting party in there. I know there's an ad hoc or ad hoc or whatever the word is, member. But I believe they don't vote, and they might vote. But if they do vote, it's one member. It's one. It's one small part of it. And and so what's happening is is the people that are actually being paid to enforce these rules have no voice. And so they're being told what to do. And when you're telling somebody what to do, and you're telling professionals that have an opinion, and you're not listening to them, that's where you're getting in trouble. And it's very simple to me. It's like you work together, and if you can work together with officials, have this same rules committee that we have, and you get input from all sides with, with Chuck Barry as a mediator, he's the new rules editor, you've got a really good recipe to have success. I think between referees and Wrestlers, you know, it's a big change, and I, I think there's going to be some confusion, and there's going to be a lot of learning to do. Um, so, you know, I'm a little apprehensive just not knowing exactly how it's going to be called it and the way things are going to go, but um, I think with, with the drop-down rule, we had kind of some similar things last year, and we're still clarifying things in, in January, honestly. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm hoping there's some, you know, clear-cut, examples that they can they can use to, to make this more um, 
I guess, understandable by everybody. And I don't remember really talking in much detail about these things. And the, the new rules came out, uh, you know, they came out early enough where we can at least digest them a little bit and, and talk about it and have some, some opportunity for di- some discussion within our team. And, and uh, you know, I've even called uh, Mike Allen, you know, at the Big Ten, the head of the Big Ten uh, Officials Association, and talk to him about it with some of my concerns. So they did it in a timely manner, but it's still, it still, it doesn't actually uh, equate to results, I think, sometimes. You can check out the latest edition of Takedown Radio for the full interviews with both Coach Brands and Coach Heffernan. You can also watch the entire NCAA rules video at the address you see on your screen. All right, wrestling fans, stay tuned. We'll be back. Headline News is up next. You're watching Takedown. Headline News is brought to you by Sunflower Wrestling. Find them online at sunflowerwrestling.com. Well, Kyle Dake has confirmed he'll be competing at 86 kilos when he travels to the Intercontinental Cup in Russia later this month. Dake has spent his entire freestyle career at 74 kilos, but has yet to beat reigning world and Olympic champ Jordan Burroughs and is now considering a move to 86. He'll use the Intercontinental Cup and the Olympic Dream Team qualifier in December to test himself at the higher weight before deciding on a permanent home for the Rio Trials. Well, the WCWA preseason rankings have been released, and for the first time ever, Campbellsville University will start the year as the consensus number one in the country. Well, the Tigers tied the two-time defending national champs of King with 107 points, but moved into the number one spot by having the most wrestlers ranked individually. Rounding out the preseason top five, Archie Randall and the Oklahoma City Stars at number three, Simon Frazier in fourth, and Lindenwood University at five. Well, the WCWA season kicked off on Friday. That's when King University won their second straight team title at the Patriot Duels. The Tornado top ninth-ranked Missouri Baptist 38-6, followed by a 37-7 win over the sixth-ranked McKendry and a 25-19 victory over King University, that in the finals. Sergeant Justin Harry Lester captured a silver medal at 75 kilos Saturday at the CISM World Military Championships in Korea. The multi-sport event included 80 nations and more than 5,000 military athletes from around the world. Lester opened with three straight tech falls to reach the finals when he defeated Ibrahim Ganam of Egypt 8-0, followed by a 10-0 shutout over his Chinese opponent Gali Qing and a 10-2 win over David Klimek of Poland. In the finals, he dropped a 6-2 decision to Korea's Kim and finished in second. Lester was the only U.S. medalist in wrestling and became the first American to win a Greco-Roman medal at the CISM World since Marcel Cooper took home bronze back in 1999. Well, the grapple on the gridiron won't be the only outdoor dual meet this year. Cal Baptist will welcome its rival, Cal Bakersfield, to campus Saturday, November 14th for the Take It Outside 2. The inaugural event featured CBU and Stanford and attracted a standing room only crowd of more than 2,500 fans, which is the current record for an outdoor dual meet. Well, Cal Baptist finished last year with the program best 13 wins. Bakersfield went 7 and 5 in Pac 12 play and qualified two athletes for the NCAA championships. Well, BJ Clegon now has an opponent for the 50th annual All Star Classic. It just keeps getting better. The NWCA announced that he will score off against Old Dominion's Alexander Lenny Richardson. Clegan finished fifth in the nation last year with an overall record of 30 and 11, while Richardson came off a 29 and 9 campaign that ended with an All American honor in St. Louis. Well, the card will feature five athletes from outside the Power Five Conference, including Lehigh's Mason Beckman and Nathaniel Brown, plus Edinburgh's returning national runner up, Vic Avery. You can purchase tickets you see on your screen, the address for right here, or you can watch it live for the very first time on ESPNU. Well, Penn State standout Andrew Alton has been added to the Franklin and Marshall coaching staff. Nice pick up there. Along with his brother Dylan, the Alton Twins were on a Nittany Lion team that won four consecutive NCAA titles over four years. Now, during his time in Happy Valley, Andrew was a two-time NCAA qualifier and one of the most prolific pinners in the country. He'll work with lower and middle weights and play a major role in recruiting. Well, speaking of twins, Evan and Xander Wick have decided to join the Wisconsin Badgers. 
Alexander is ranked 47th in the 2016 class and was a California State runner-up last year. He went on to finish fifth at the Junior Freestyle Nationals this summer. Evan will enter his senior year ranked 56 overall and is coming off two top five finishes over the last two years. In other recruiting news, Kevin Jackson has locked up yet another top 100 prospect from Michigan. On Wednesday, returning champion Parker announced that he'd join the Cyclones in 2016. The junior freestyle All-American is currently ranked 72nd in the country and will join fellow Michigan standout Kanan Store in ISU's incoming class. Parker is a three-time state placer and finished fourth this past spring at the Flow Nationals. He projects out at 125 or 33 for the surging clones. Well, the Dan Gable Gala has added some more star power to a list already loaded with wrestling royalty. In addition to Gable and several other Hall of Famers from around the country, national women's coach Terry Steiner and three-time defending world champ Adeline Gray will be in Des Moines that special October 24th. Although it's not yet been confirmed, there's a good chance that Republican presidential frontrunner Donald Trump could make an appearance there as well. Trump flew to Waterloo last Thursday and spent several hours with Gable, who said he has admired him throughout his life. Well, you can buy your tickets or get that information you so desperately need at NWHOF. Dot org. All right, they're telling me we have to take a quick break, so stay tuned. There's more to come. You're watching Takedown. All right, welcome back. It's time to send it over to three guys who know an awful lot about wrestling, surely a lot more than I do. Here's Larry Nugent, Bobby Douglas, and Wayne Bachman with Episode 6 of The Legend Chronicles. Hi everybody, welcome back to The Legend Chronicles. I'm with Bobby Douglas and Wayne Bachman. And this week's episode, I'm Larry Nugent by the way, uh, this week's episode is The Pinners. And so this might be the most fun segment that we've done yet. And uh, you guys have seen some of the great pinners of all time. Uh, the Hodge Trophy every year is given to the best collegiate wrestler. Uh, you knew Dan Hodge. He was a Sooner. Uh, a little bit before your time, but talk to me about uh, Dan Hodge as the pinner. Well, first of all, again, I think I mentioned earlier that poor Robertson's philosophy was from the whistle, the first whistle to the last whistle, do nothing but try to pin your opponent, go for the pin, and the score will take care of itself. Don't worry about the score, just go for the pin, and you'll probably win the match. And Dan Hodge and Tommy Evans were the two people that I know of that totally bought into that philosophy. And they went out from whistle to whistle doing nothing but trying to pin their opponents. Every move they made was to try to put their opponent on the back, not just score. Yeah, yeah. Anybody stick out in your mind? Well, I... We're, we're, we're going to go to an interview with Randy Lewis and you in a minute. But anybody before we go to that that you want to talk about? Uh, Dan the Beast Severn, uh, oh. mixed martial art uh, fame and NCAA fame also uh, as a freshman he pinned the uh, national champion twice in, in two days, and he beat another national champion. Uh, the champion was, Mar uh, was Evans from Minnesota. Yes, yeah. And uh, then the next day, he beat and pinned Howard Harris from Oregon State. Uh, after he pinned Howard Harris, he pinned uh, Gibson from Oregon, and then the next uh, Monday, he pinned the national champion again from Minnesota. So he he, pin, he pinned the first 22 guys that he wrestled in college. <laughs> so he's, I'd consider him yeah. to be a pretty good pinner. You, you couldn't go through with this without saying Dan Severin. Dan the Beast Severin. Dan the Beast Severin. Uh, well, we have a really good interview uh, with you and, and Randy Lewis. And uh, Randy was actually one of the great pinners of all time as well. Uh, let's go to that uh, interview and, and listen to uh, Randy and Bobby. Uh, but the people that you mentioned, they were Jesus. pinners. And the thing yeah. that's, that I think is interesting is those pinners are the ones that bring the crowd. Those pinners are the ones that uh, uh, get the attention of the audience. So we had some great pinners in Iowa. And my favorite wrestlers of all time are always the pinners. And uh, I, I went to the Olympic trials as a junior in high school. I tried out at 114 and... 
the most I, I remember watching Wade Shallis hit lace leg throws and guys a double leg to his back and he'd be on it be sitting like on his butt and he'd elevate them to their back and he'd reverse them to their back and he was very comfortable giving up his leg and reaching back and doing all these lace leg throws and hitting a lot of the throws and I just I watched it and never got didn't film I just watched him wrestle like five matches and just said I can do that and I had a I had a way. I picked up a lot of Wade Chalice, and I, I attribute a lot of my style that I changed my junior year in high school. And I was already a pinner because I set the national high school record with 45 pins in a row. And so I, I tried to pin everybody, and, and I wish they didn't have the tech fall because it's more fun to pin guys. Chalice stands trying to get that right leg away from John Chapman. But Chapman trips him up and brings him back down to the mat. What would you say Charles was trying to do? Elevate under the arm, try to kick him over. Yeah, he did! Charles comes over, he reverses Chapman. He has Chapman on his back. He has a body first made a pin. A pin. So that is our segment on the pinners. And I hope you've enjoyed it. I, I, it's part uh, of, of wrestling that I think everybody can really appreciate. And uh, thanks to Randy Lewis for joining us on that interview with Bobby. And thank you, Bobby, for being with us again, Wayne Bachman. So with that, I'll say goodbye. See you next week. All right, when we return, we're going to head to New York City and talk grapple in the garden. So stay tuned. You're watching Takedown. Well, four months before Madison Square Garden holds the Division I championship for the first time, 22 teams will be inside the world's most famous arena for the fourth annual Grapple at the Garden. Joining us now, MSG's Director of Sporting Events, Dylan Wanigel. Dylan, how's it going? Well, great, Scott. Thanks for having me on the show. Certainly, it's a whole uh, team of people here at Madison Square Garden excited for uh, our fourth annual Grapple at the Garden. Uh, exciting times indeed. Well, tell me about some of the teams that will be highlighting this year's event. Sure, we're excited once again to have uh, uh, Cornell uh, and Rutgers, who have been two of uh, the, the top uh, ticket sellers and, and fans uh, here in, in the Northeast, uh, really support those programs. And for the first time in the four years of this event, uh, those teams will actually face each other. Uh, really, another exciting matchup is Cornell's other dual meet versus Nebraska. Uh, which I'm sure the fans are excited about. And, and uh, personally, it's great to have Illinois coming out here uh, with Isaiah Martinez coming off of his uh, incredible uh, season last year, undefeated national champion. Um, so that's uh, some of the real highlights that we have uh, for, the, for this year. All right. I know you're a Rutgers guy, and I think they've had an All-American the last two or three years, Dylan. Uh, for them having an All-American, uh, I believe that's two consecutive years. Uh, uh, as a lifelong New Jersey resident, uh, that's that's great to see. Uh, have very happy for them and their program. And, uh, and Coach Goodale's been uh, uh, very good to us from day one. So very happy for him. Uh, we're certainly excited to have Hofstra here, who is our partner on the national championships coming up in March. They're the host university for uh, the D1 nationals coming here, which are going to be unbelievable. Uh, so, uh, yeah, a lot of great uh, stuff going on for college wrestling here at the Garden. All right, Dylan, for the first time, I want to invite people to check out our extended interview at TakedownWrestle.com. Also, November 29th is the date. I'll look forward to seeing you in the city. Dylan, thanks for the time. Thank you, Scott. Yes, uh, TheGarden.com for more information. All right, you want to learn a new move, but you don't know where to go. Oh, well, how about this? Sit back in your chair. I got a guy. It's the technique guy, Chad Lohman, with your Grandview Technique of the Week. Hi, I'm Nick Mitchell, head wrestling coach at Grandview University. Today we have Chad Lohman bringing you the technique of the week. All right, this week I'm going to show you guys how to go from an elbow pass and get your low single. So guys, going to collar time me right here with his right arm. I'm going to get a good bite in here. I'm going to pull it real close to me. And, I'll get, and I'm going to cheat as I get my right leg forward. Next thing I want to do is I like to fake right here to his, his uh, front leg. And I'm going to come right here to his knee my, with my head. And finish like a low single. So it's really important when you collar ties me, 
and I get this elbow and I'm clamping hard. And I can push into him, I get that fake, sticks his leg away, and hit the little single. <clears throat> but one time fast for you. He collar ties, I clamp, I fake, right to my little single. <clears throat> that's a little single off of an elbow tie, and that's your technique of the week. All right, thanks, Chad. Hey, what do you say? Let's find out who scored that free singlet from the Takedown Sportswear Company in Atlanta, Georgia, along with other great gear from Asics and Adidas. This week's Super Singlet Sunday winner, Joey Craig. Hey, congratulations, Joey. If you want to score a free singlet, just follow along on Facebook and Twitter. Like and retweet the messages throughout the week. You, too, could be a big winner. Maybe next week's big winner. All right, that'll do it for this week's show. Don't forget to check out our website for articles, interviews, and all things wrestling. Find us also online on Facebook for breaking wrestling news as it happens. And join us on Saturday mornings for the show that started it all, Takedown Wrestling Radio. So from our studios here in 3B, Des Moines, Iowa, I'm Scott Casper, and that's what's trending on Takedown. We'll see you next week.